and your praise God. I wish tonight I had the ability to tell you the worth of your eleven or so eleven or so page. <laughs> Rodney said he didn't care as long as it's real big letters. <laughs> I could do it like Brother Woody. Uh, he puts a, a mint in his mouth and said, when this is gone, I'm through. <laughs> That'd be my luck to get a button. <laughs> Tonight I hope to oversimplify a message about the kingdom of God and about the glory of God. I think the two are quite synonymous really. And uh, uh, the scripture I've been using about the kingdom of God is within you is... I think a time that uh, Jesus told the Pharisees the kingdom of God is in your midst is what it meant. And the kingdom of God is in our midst. Amen. I can't to you, and in case I forget to say it later on in, in, this, in this message, I, I, I want to be able to, to convey the message to each of you how many of you, I want to see your, how many of you believe that the word of God is true? Amen. Praise God, that's, that's 100%, almost 100%. Now, the reason, I, the reason I wanted to corner you on that, I got you trapped now. <laughs> because the Bible says in 1 John, talking about Jesus, as he is, so are we in this world. That's what it says. Now, I, I, I don't know if I'm not quite there yet. Uh, because uh, somebody asked me, oh, occasionally I'll have a preacher ask me how I'm doing. And I, I say, I'm not quite Acts 10.38 yet. How many of you can quote Acts 10.38? Acts <laughs> 10.38. Most of you could if you just saw the few words. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. If God had to be with Jesus, then he's with us. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I and my Father will come to you and we will make our abode with you. Praise God, there's something living on the inside of me that is bigger than the storms of life. There's something living on the inside of me that's bigger than hell itself when hell presents itself to stand in my way. Hallelujah. <coughs> As a matter of fact, Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Who's the church? It's not this building. It's not these four walls. In the Psalms, we find a somewhat forgotten and oft times overlooked truth. This was a Psalm of David. The one thing I like to remember about David is that in, in 1 Samuel, I'm not going to turn to 1 Samuel, but whenever Samuel anointed him to be king, uh, the Bible said that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, came upon him from that day forward. Praise God. So to me, it's easier to understand how David was ready to take on the giant when the giant showed up. Praise God. I, I, I believe that if our faith was all that it needed to be, uh, I believe that, that uh, we would have a different outlook about the problems that come to us. And when the problems come, and, and we've learned some time ago that we need to quit telling God about the problem and start telling the problem about God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. But anyhow, this, this David psalm, 
that he wrote by the Spirit of God. The Bible, that's what the Bible said, that holy men of old wrote as they were inspired. Psalm 3, verse 3 said, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter, <clears throat> the lifter up of my head. Now, my glory... I want you to think about that for a little bit. Uh, I, want you to, I want you to think differently about God. This is who David is talking about here. And I want you to think about it from a standpoint of Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. <laughs> and uh, if we will, we'll be able to say it like David said. What did, what did David, I want to look at those two words for a moment. My glory. I want you to say my glory. My glory. Now you said the word my. Who, who does that mean it belongs to? Amen. Amen. It belongs to you. Praise God. I think if we could get a revelation of those two words, any time we face a trial, we'd realize that there's something on the inside of us ready to boil over at our command. Hallelujah. Ready to boil over at our surrender to the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, ready to do battle for us. Now, uh, my glory... Uh, can can we can I just I just wonder if if I could get you just trick you into saying saying this with me. God is my glory. Now uh, you don't know how you well some of you know how true that really is. God is your glory. I can remember the days when when Ken Moore was traveling. Traveling the land, and sometimes he'd call me three o'clock in the morning or whenever, and say, "Brother Buck, would you pray for me? I'm having breathing problems, and I got something going on." Hallelujah! And we'd call on the heaven, we'd call on the, uh, the the power of heaven to manifest. And while Ken was running up and down the road, the power of God would show up, uh, and suddenly he was able to do what he couldn't do before. God is my glory. Hallelujah. Ken, say it with me. God is my glory. God is my glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you're facing difficulty, God is on board, and we need to release the glory of God. Hallelujah. Uh, Colossians 1 27 in, in, in uh, verse 26 it's telling who it's talking to it's talking to the saints but in verse 27 to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you the hope of glory one translation I looked at one time said the hope of realizing the glory. Amen. Praise God. That's a wonderful truth. I read, not turning there, but I read over in the book of Revelation about the city of God coming down. And the Bible said of the city of God having the glory of God. Why does it have the glory of God? Because God is in it. Praise the Lord. So I say to you, I look at this congregation tonight when, and with a broad sweep of my hand, I say, having the glory of God because Christ is in you and He is the hope of glory. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to read some scripture to you out of uh, Revelation Chapter 4, I'll try to read it fast, and this is, this is the New King James, I believe, so it might be different from what's showing up up here. Revelation chapter 4. What did I say? Oh, chapter 4. <laughs> After these things, looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven... And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, I will show place. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Verse 3. 
And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Verse 4, round about the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. Verse 5, and from the throne proceeded lightning, thunderings, and voices. And seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Verse 6. Uh, the throne, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Uh, verse 7. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. And the third uh, living creature had a face like a man. The fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Verse 8. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes round and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I believe, pray God, that there's preparation in heaven today. I can almost see the armies of heaven uh, uh, with their curry combs uh, currying down them white horses if they do that in heaven. Pray God they're cinching their saddles down uh, and I believe that they're sharpening their swords uh, and they're getting ready to come back with Jesus because he's coming again. Hallelujah. You can, you can have all of the people that you want to. The preacher's going to be no rapture, but I'm going to tell you one of these days, Jesus Christ is going to split the eastern sky like they used to say, and he's coming back to this earth. Hallelujah. All of these people that think Satan's in charge, uh, you just wait just a short season, and you're going to find out for sure who's in charge. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Verse 9 said, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever. Verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, verse 11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and are created. <laughs> the Apostle John saw the people of God again and again as worshipers. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. That's what Brother Pastor Charles has been, has been doing in this church since, since, uh, since he took the reins of this thing. He's been encouraging you to worship God. And that's what John is seeing here. He's calling people to word. That's the reason for the scripture this morning in the, in the book of Hebrews chapter 13 that said that we need to give God the fruit of our lips, a, a, a continual worship, which is the fruit of our lips. Now, <coughs> y'all excuse me, I got something going on in my throat. <coughs> In this passage, in the book of Revelation, he saw the living creatures worshiping God. He saw the 24 elders casting their thrones before the Lord. They were worshiping. He heard them calling out, You're worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will, by your will they exist and were created. As late as the last chapter of the book of Revelation, John said this, this is Revelation 22 and 8 and 9. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See thou do it not, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, after being caught up in the glory and seeing all the things that, that, uh, that will be, having the greatest insights of any man in this generation, John received this simple message from the angel. Worship God. Hallelujah. You have no idea sometimes what it's worth to you. Praise God. I think whenever we get 
pulled over on the highway for speeding. And the policeman comes to the window, and we roll the window down. We ought to be sitting there, Sean dying. <laughs> I remember the days of the Rodney Howard Brown revival, and, and uh, people would leave his meetings and get pulled over because people thought they were drunk and they couldn't quit laughing long enough to tell the officer what was going on. By this, time, by this time, John should have had a Ph.D. in Revelation. Why the simple message worship God as much as he knew? Why the simple message of worship God? After all, that's a very basic, that's just a basic truth, right? Well, aren't we worshiping God already? Let me tell you what happened. See, I, I sat here and I noticed because I'm the same way. I have to fight a warfare to enter into a place of worship. i got to fight this flesh. Hallelujah. If you ever see me over there slapping hands on my head saying, Come out of there, you know what's going on. <laughs> we, we, get, we get so caught up in some complexities and so forth that we forget that God's message is simply about the simplicity of worshiping Him. Praise God. He, he's more than willing to teach us uh, by His Spirit how to be true worshipers. He's more than willing to allow His Spirit to move upon us in order to expand our borders and enlarge us more and more so that we can offer Him what is pleasing in His sight. Hallelujah. When we learn the simplicity of worshiping Him, what this does is, and we'll, we'll cover it more in just a minute, this brings the glory and the power of God into this dimension. And that's what the world needs. The world needs a worshiping church. We've got everything else in this dimension. I'm telling you, in Washington, D.C., they're loosing everything they can loose on this world. Your, your, your political action committees and so forth, are, are, are battling to bring about uh, uh, and give glory to the God of this world. But there must arise within this world a church that will give all the glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. That will so give Him glory. Somebody said, well, we're waiting on a great revival. We're waiting on a great, re a great awakening. It ain't going to come until the church, by their worship, brings Him into this dimension. Hallelujah. 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 Know this. One day, all nations will gather in the city of Jerusalem to worship the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And we'll be there that day. Glory to God. Did you notice that the activity that John noticed was around the throne, out of the throne, before the throne, and in the midst of the throne? Most Christians are only familiar with one scripture about the throne. That's in Hebrews 4, 16, where it said, Let us come boldly before the throne, that we may pr uh, pray for mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, during the time of prayer, we say, Let us come before the throne of grace and make our petitions. But let's listen. We're, we're very oriented toward petitions and requests. That's what we do. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it. But I'm going to go a little bit different way with it tonight. May I tell you that there is a realm in God so great that even though you may have come a dozen more uh, a, a dozen times with your dozen petitions and so forth that when we enter in to really worship in God and I, now this is talking about private worship there's a difference in public worship and private worship and, and really that we ought to be able to if, if we if we get radical enough in our private worship with God It'll be easier for us 
to bring it into public worship and release it in public worship. Why, what makes a difference between private worship and public worship? One can put a thousand to flight. <laughs> hallelujah. Ha -ha, hallelujah. If any two of you agree is touching any one thing, what about if any 30 of you agree as touching any one thing? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's something about corporate worship. I've said before, you get a dimension of the presence of God that you don't get any other way in corporate worship. Somebody said, well, the TV's my church on Sunday morning. Well, <laughs> and, uh, it's all right if you're crippled and shut in and, and uh, you've had both legs cut off. <laughs> but if you can move, you ought to find a house of God to be in. Otherwise, you're a little bit hypocritical. And then, no, Lord, I didn't get up to be that nasty. <laughs> I think it's time people put their heart where their mouth is, if I said that right. But anyhow, when we come into the presence of God in that dimension, and we've got all those needs on our mind and on our heart, when we really worship God and we get through, you know, and we're, we're caught up in the Spirit, and God says, now, what was it you was wanting? <laughs> and suddenly, all that's been satisfied. And we say, nothing, Lord. I'm just fine. There's something about entering into that, that dimension, that realm of worship that satisfies the need of our heart, that gives us the kind of faith to go out to, and grab the bull by the horns, praise God, and, and, uh, and just handle the thing. Hallelujah. Yeah, the one, 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 uh, one example I can think of right at the moment is, I should have written them down. One example I can think of right at the moment is Jesus said, don't worry what you're going to say when you're delivered before the determinate council because the Holy Ghost in that same hour will give you what you need to say. Praise God. Somebody says, is that the only realm it works in? No, I don't think so, because Jesus said, don't worry. Uh, don't, don't worry about taking clothes with you or taking food with you because I'll feed you and clothe you. Praise God. Was there something you wanted to ask me? No, Lord. No questions. No requests. No petition. Everything has been satisfied in the midst of the worship that ushers you into the glory of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In His presence, the things that seem so large to us become insignificant. We wonder why we ever allow the devil to fight us over that thing. That we make it so important and magnify it so much. There's a greater change. Listen to me. I believe this all my heart. I told you I was going to simplify it and I believe I'm simplifying it. There's a greater change individually and corporately that comes about through worship than through any other means. So if you want to be changed, worship is the key. When Jesus said, enter into your prayer closet, he wasn't talking about just crying and snotting and pouring it all out to God and, and blubbering and just telling him what a hard time you're going through. But that's all, I hope it's all right because I do that. I cry real tears sometimes. <laughs> Hallelujah. But there's something about worshiping when you're all alone and nobody else is around. Brother Charles been talking about character this morning. He had the nerve to tell his congregation with me in it what you are when you're at home by yourself and there's nobody else around. That's your character. That's what you are. I've had better people than him say that to me. <laughs> Billy Graham said it. Hallelujah. So if you want to be changed, worship is the key. Hallelujah. When you're worshiping, you look into his face and you're changed from glory to glory. That's what the Bible said. They, they 
wrote a song about it. From glory to glory, he's changing me. I ain't singing no more of it. <coughs> Here's a simple principle. How many of you know people that uh, just really like deer hunting and not much else? <laughs> they become like what they worship, you know. <laughs> Man, you can see them. They, they show up at the store. They're all dressed up in camouflage. <laughs> you can't even see them. <laughs> Amen. So we become like that which we worship. We become like him who we worship. So we just need to plug into God with a depth of worship. That'll bring change into our life. It'll bring change into what we want to be. It'll bring change into what we want to see happen. Hallelujah. There's something I believe. Somebody said, well, I'm waiting on God. Well, maybe God's waiting on us. I can sit down and, and read every book on holiness that I can find, and I might develop some level of understanding on the subject. But I can worship for a short time, and I feel His holiness. And I know what true holiness is. Hallelujah. It's in His presence that we find that. Praise God. I, I, was, I was thinking about, no, I'm not going there. Well, Brother Charles talked about it before, <laughs> before he sat down. He, he said they learned, talk, they learned them, learned them to be afraid. <laughs> they learned me that too. <laughs> Praise God. I want to tell you what David said in, in uh, 1 Chronicles 28, verse 2. King David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made preparations to build it. Now we got to, we got to figure out what David is saying here. <coughs> What David is really saying is the place of worship is the footstool of the Lord. That's why, that's, that's why, that's why that I'm encouraging you to worship in your private devotions. And, and worship to the extent in your private devotions that you can't wait to come to the house of God and couple that with everybody else that's worshiping just to see how much glory can be released in the house of God. I believe that's the will of God. Now, <laughs> Psalm 132 verse 7 said, Let us go into his tabernacle, let us worship at his footstool. As God's people... We know that we are now experiencing an insatiable hunger for the glory of God. Glory is God's revelation for now. We are ready to worship at His footstool. Every service needs both praise and worship. Now listen here. We worship or we praise. How many of you felt the presence of the Lord in the, in the uh, song service tonight. Pray God. How many of you feel like that you, you uh, went beyond just feeling the presence of the Lord and you actually entered into a little bit of worship tonight? I did. Praise God. I, I, I was over there cutting all kinds of shenanigans. We praise until the spirit of worship comes. <clears throat> and when... When we worship, no, we praise until the spirit of worship comes, and then we worship until the glory comes, and then we stand in the glory. Now, in case I forget to get into it, after I want to go ahead and tell you tonight, I told you I was going to simplify this thing, and we're waiting for the glory of God to manifest and we want it to show up in a pink cloud or a blue cloud or a white cloud. Really, I wouldn't care what color the cloud was because if it's God's glory, 
it, it ain't going to affect my breathing. Matter of fact, Ken, if I breathe some of that, it probably heal my breathing and yours too. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now, the, the, yes, I'm talking about the glory, the manifestation of the glory. I believe that when we feel the presence of Almighty God in the service of the house of the Lord, we're feeling His glory. His glory is manifesting through us. Praise God. When somebody gives a message in tongues and somebody else interprets, that's God's glory being made manifest in the house of God. That's the work of God's kingdom being made manifest in our midst. Hallelujah. When somebody gets up and can't stand it and they start dancing all over the place, that's God's glory manifested in this present world. Somebody said, well, how, how can you believe that? Uh, whatever is loosed in heaven is loosed on earth. I believe that we're Worship is loosed in heaven, and don't tell me there's just going to be hallelujah. Sing it again. Hallelujah. No. <laughs> it's going to be all kinds of stuff. There's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be old line Pentecostals there that don't know anything ever. And they, they're going to do the buck dance worshiping God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody said, oh, you don't mean they'll be irreverent toward God. No, their heart will be so full of appreciation that they're standing before God, that God sending His Son was not a wasted effort on their part. Hallelujah. That they're going to invent ways to give God the glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. We praise until the spirit of worship comes, and we worship till the glory comes, and then we stand in His glory. Praise brings an increase of the anointing, but worship brings the majesty of God into the midst of the congregation. That's God's glory. Worship can have that holy hush. Worship can erupt or manifest in many different ways. You know, the people down at the First Presbyterian Church might not understand it if we got up and started running or started doing the buck dance. They might think we ought to be more reverent to God. But I'm going to tell you, whatever it takes for you to satisfy your heart's cry to worship God, that's what you need to do. Some people just want to be quiet. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a good commercial on TV now <laughs> about them little nose strips that holds your nose up. Mom, have you seen them? But this lady gets to tell people to, to put one of those on and just, just shut up and go to sleep. <laughs> Uh, praise God. Oh, we need to be liberated in our worship. Psalm 24 says, And the King of glory shall come in. Hallelujah. He's waiting for us to lift up your head, O ye gates. What's a gate? A gate is an entrance. Lift up your head, O ye gates. In worship, and the King of glory shall come in that gate. Hallelujah. <coughs> Let's just pretend that this is my gate. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and the King of glory shall come in. After you've lifted up your gates and you've lifted up the everlasting doors, the King of glory comes in. This psalm is speaking about the Lord Himself, the Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle, the Lord of hosts. We know Him as Savior. We know Him as Healer. We know Him as Holy Ghost Baptizer. We know Him as Provider, Jehovah Jireh. We know Him as El Shaddai, the God who's more than enough. We know Him as Adonai. We know Him as Elohim. It is now time that we come to know Him as the King of glory. What's another time when the glory is manifested? 
I can see Jesus when he walked up and down the, uh, the dusty ways of, of Palestine preaching the gospel. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The multitudes came to him and the Bible said he healed them all. That was the glory of God manifested in this world. Do you think the devil wants to stop that? I think that he has in most cases. There are still places where people get healed. But I pray that God's people will learn to worship Him to the extent that healing miracles begin to flow back into the house of God in mass. Hallelujah. I'd love to see some houses of God where the people learn to worship God to the extent uh, that cripples and, and, and crooks and whatever else were lined up to get into the house of God to have hands laid on them so that the glory of God could be made manifest in their life. It's time that the glory of God uh, became loosed in the house of God so that the kingdom and dominion of hell itself can be driven back uh, and that the light of God can dispel the darkness in people's lives once again. Hallelujah. Know this, that every experience we have in and with God has one purpose and one purpose only. That is to know Him. I must know Him more than I did yesterday. That's one of the reasons I love that song. I need you more, more than yesterday. I, don't you just love that song? I do. Hallelujah. The majestic picture that we see in the book of Revelation is the king of glory coming for his glorious bride, the church of the Lord Jesus. He fights our battles. He's Lord of hosts, mighty in battle. <coughs> It is only in the realm of glory that we can live in the place where he fights all our battles for us. Praise God. I don't like too much more, folks. I don't know what time I started. I don't really care right now. I feel good. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Hallelujah. So, so give him all your struggles, all your frustrations, all your discouragement, all your disappointments. He's more than able to deal with them. Come to know the King of Kings. Uh, uh, come to know the King of Glory in His power. Praise the Lord. Brother Dean. Make a public example of you, brother. We come to God, we got all kinds of stuff hanging on us sometimes, don't we? Yep. Brother Dean used to be captivated with a little habit uh, called smoking. But he conquered that habit when he come to know the King of Glory. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Trish, is it? Yeah, yeah. Praise God. Well, I'll tell you what, when y'all when y'all when y'all pray, Lord, you tell the Lord, said Lord, you you help me quit that that problem. Help Brother Jordan quit eating. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is such a great privilege and honor that we have of having the presence of God. There are people, there, there, there are thousands of churches in this nation that don't care one flip about having the presence of God come into their services. Matter of fact, it gets a little bit too complicated for them. Yeah. <laughs> Sister Jordan's got an album uh, about this guy that sings about it. He said he, he's, he's, a, he's a Baptist, said it's too much work to be a Pentecostal. <laughs> That's just what the song said, and the guy's a Baptist that wrote it, so there you go. Now, it, it's, this is such a great privilege and honor. It's given unto us to know the King of glory and to know His kingdom. When we feel the power of God in our midst, that's His kingdom manifesting. That's His glory manifesting. 
I realize that there are other things that should be said about the kingdom of God that would put it in its proper perspective, and, and we will do that in the days ahead. But I want to tell you that if it were something that were unattainable, the Lord would never have spoken and said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hallelujah. Ha, hallelujah. My God, when the when, the, when the, uh, the, the apostles were filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, that day 3,000 souls were birthed into the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God was made manifest. They preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and he revealed his glory by sweeping 3,000 people into his kingdom at once. It's given unto us to know everything that pertains to the King of glory and His kingdom. I believe God wants us to be familiar with the things of heaven. Uh, the reason I say that is because uh, I've already mentioned maybe Matthew 16 where it said, On this rock I'll be on the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. You remember it said that? I'll give you the keys. And we, we, I believe there are things we can know. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Praise God. I, I, one translation says, whatever, whatever is loosed in heaven, that will be what is loosed on earth. And whatever is already bound in heaven will be that that you bind on earth. So, so I believe that God wants us to know what's loosed in heaven and what's bound in heaven. I'm going to tell you one thing for sure. I believe we already know to the extent that we ain't going to do some of the things that was just recently done in the halls of the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Consider this. You can be familiar with, with the, the places of heaven and the courts of the Lord as much as the person in England knows the Buckingham Palace. It's given unto us to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Many times when we speak about having the keys of the kingdom, we emphasize the action. It's, it is true there are keys of the kingdom that bring forth action. Whatever you bind, I, I got ahead of myself, whatever you bind on earth, I'll be bound in heaven. We must be oriented toward the king and his kingdom, not just toward the works of the kingdom. That's why we're talking about worshiping God. When we worship Him, it liberates Him, His Spirit, and His power to flow in the church. I believe God wants His power manifested in this end time. Know this. In the presence of the King, there's a sense of great majesty and awe. Praise God. I just, I just felt it real strong over here tonight. Just consider the majesty and awesomeness in the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I saw, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid, I'm the first and the last. I'm he who lives and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and of death. Listen to the amplified version of the same passage. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the ever-living one. I am living in the eternity of eternities. I died, but see, I am alive forevermore, and I possess the keys of death and hell, or uh, Hades, the realm of the dead. <coughs> now, <coughs> here's a little section that ties you, so ties you into this thing, Excuse me. And it's something that Brother Charles has already mentioned tonight. The king of glory deserves a chosen generation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why, why should we let the devil defeat us about what we endeavor to do in the realm of Christianity? Because the king of glory deserves the chosen generation. The king of glory deserves a royal priesthood. Hallelujah. The king of glory deserves a holy nation. The king of glory deserves a peculiar people. He deserves that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The king of glory uh, deserves that. Worship him. Hallelujah. Worship the king of glory. I got, I got a page and a half here of I am's 
that I'm not going to get into tonight. I'll just, I'll just maybe read just a couple of them because, because he's made a way for us to be a part of the kingdom of God, because he's manifested his life to us, because he wants his, his glory manifested in our lives. We can say, I am a child of God. I'm not going to give you the verses for these take too long. I am redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I'm forgiven. I'm saved through, uh, the, by grace through faith. I'm justified, sanctified, a new creation in Christ Jesus, a partaker of his divine nature. I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. I'm delivered from the powers of darkness. I'm led by the Spirit of God. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm kept in safety where, wherever I go. I'm casting all my cares on him. Hallelujah. I'm a an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm an heir to the blessings of Abraham. I'm blessed coming in and going out. Praise God. I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I'm healed by his stripes. I'm hidden with Christ in God. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I'm exercising authority over the enemy. I'm above and not beneath. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm establishing God's word here on earth. I'm an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and by the word of thy testimony. Uh, hallelujah. I'm overcoming the devil. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm walking by faith and not by sight. I'm casting down vain imagination. I'm bringing every thought into captivity. I'm being transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm a laborer together with God, an imitator of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Hallelujah. I'm going to quit. I'm out of breath. So, God's kingdom and God's glory I'm going to submit to you tonight that God saved you. He sent His Son into this world to redeem you from the curse of sin and death so that His heavenly kingdom and His glory could be made manifest in the life that you live 24-7. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that God uh, wants a people that are ready to manifest, let the kingdom manifest, Every moment of their life. That's not that it will manifest every moment of your life, but it'll be present every moment of your life because it's in you. Well, that's one of the reasons the enemy sends so many assignments against us because he don't want us thinking, Lord, what will you have me to do? Is there somebody you want me to talk to? Is there somebody I can be a blessing to? Is there somebody I can manifest the kingdom of God to? You have my message tonight. I, I pray that, that God will bless it to your heart. I, I pray that when we come back in here that, that you can get this old fat boy that sits over here beside the Sister Jordan, that you can get him liberated into worship. Praise God. We need to, we need to see the power of God flowing in this house. Amen. Does that mean that, that, that Pastor Charles or Pastor Neil or our Brother Buck or, or, or some great leader that might come in is going to do everything that there is to be done. No, he wants to do it through each individual one of you. You are the chosen generation. You are the royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. You are the one that God wants to tell the world uh, uh, that, that he's uh, delivered you out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Hallelujah. He wants you to carry his message of love and redemption to a dying world. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. I'm <laughs> I've used up a lot of my energy. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Before I quit tonight, I, a message like this, I don't even know how to make an altar call. Um, the only thing I hate about the way they've done that, I can't lean on it, did you? <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. I don't know how to make an altar call tonight, but if anybody wants prayer, uh,
There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you.